the crackle of lightning across the battlefield, the wound healing by mere touch, the horror of the soldier rising up from the ground to fight again, his corpse animated by the dark power of necromancy. Hello and welcome to another episode of Just in Time Worlds. Today I would like to discuss battle magic and its inclusion in fantasy armies. I'm going to break down today's video into a basics of what a fantasy army is, and then I'm going to talk about how magic can be included in a fantasy army in various capacities. And finally, I'm going to talk about how magic is included in armies in terms of where a mage slots into the army. My name is Marie Mullaney, and this is another episode of Just in Time Worlds. If you like this kind of content, please do hit the subscribe button. And if you want to join in the conversation, I do have a Discord server, link in the description down below, where you can connect around my content, my upcoming book, and all kinds of world building discussions. Okay, let's get cracking. What I really need to cover in the basics of a fantasy army is the various troop types that you can have. If any specific component of this army sounds very interesting to you, comment down below, let me know, and I'll see if I can make a specific video about that kind of troop and its use in fantasy armies. Right, on to basic troop types. First, let's talk about light infantry. This type of troop is often called a skirmisher. They are usually deployed in a skirmish line, an irregular open formation that is much more spread out in depth and in breadth than a traditional line formation. Their purpose is to harass the enemy by engaging them in only light or sporadic combat to delay their movement, disrupt their attack, or weaken their morale. Such tactics are collectively called skirmishing. Heavy infantry fights in a tight formation. Examples of this include the Roman legions or the troops that formed the body of Shaka Zulu's bullhorn formation. Light cavalry are skirmishers again, though they actually were more lightly armoured than heavy cavalry. They often used sabres of various sorts and were quite often horse archers as well. The most famous example of light cavalry is probably the Mongol hordes, who were one of the most effective fighting forces in the world. Heavy cavalry is both more heavily armoured and more likely to fight in a formation. The origin of heavy cavalry goes all the way back to the chariots used in the Bronze Age. Chariots were eventually replaced by cataphracts way back when, and cataphracts very clearly influenced the medieval knights that arose in Europe. The last type of troop that I want to discuss is the ranged warrior. Now ranged can be included in an army as part of the skirmishers of both light infantry and light cavalry, but it can also be a specialized unit that serves to break the enemy unit's morale and defensive lines. Our oldest ranged weapon is probably the sling. There is a quote from Didorius Siculus, a Greek historian from the 1st century AD, that shows very clearly how important slingers were in ancient warfare. But when Hamalcar saw that his men were being overpowered and that the Greeks in constantly increasing number were making their way into the camp, he brought up his slingers, who came from the Balearic Islands and numbered at least a thousand. By hurling a shower of great stones, they wounded many and even killed not a few of those who were attacking, and they shattered the defensive armor of most of them. For these men, who are accustomed to slinging stones weighing a mina, contribute a great deal to the victory in battle. In this way, they drove the Greeks from the camp and defeated them. If you'd like me to do a video on ranged weapons or the weapons used by these various troop types, let me know and I'll add that to the list as well. This breakdown excludes your navy, which is a beast by itself, and it also excludes any flying troops that you might have. 
flying can quite dramatically impact an army. And I thought I might cover that in a future video on fantastical elements of a fantasy army, like fantasy races and creatures. Let me know if that would be interesting to you and I'll prioritize it. Also, if you're interested in a navy breakdown and how magic could be used there, let me know that too. Let's move on to magic and fantasy armies. So the first thing that you need to understand is that if both sides have mages, counterspelling is going to be a thing. Now, there is an amazing quote by a character called Nakor from Raymond Face that goes something along the lines of, the first mage casts the spell, the second mage casts the spell, then the army comes along, and while the mages are counterspelling each other, the, the army kills them both. Which, yeah, I can see that happening. But attacking with spells and counterspelling would be a critical part of two armies clashing when both contain mages. So if you're constructing battle magic and you're going to have it have a very direct impact on the battlefield, consider how it could be countered and whether it would be countered. This is, of course, the most direct model of battle magic, where you have mages tossing fireballs, mages tossing lightning, mages protecting the troops from the other mages' activity and all that kind of very, very direct magic. But it's probably not your most influential magic. That kind of mage is predominantly like an artillery cannon. So it's the same kind of effect as we have today where you have long-range artillery shelling a position. It's devastating, but it doesn't actually change warfare all that much. It's just another weapon. So let's talk about some subtler applications of magic that have enormous impact. Healing and necromancy are two sides of a coin. So healing allows you to pick up your troops. It allows you to bring people back to the battlefield faster. If your healer can instantaneously heal people up, like a D&D &D spell, for example, you can keep an army going for ages. All you need is enough healers to keep picking people up or healers at a specific location where people are dragged to to be healed. Either one of these two models works. Necromancy allows you to do the same thing, except that it turns your troops into mooks. Now, necromancy also gives you the added benefit of being able to raise the enemy's troops against them, inflicting not just the enemy's troops on your enemy, but also the horror of them seeing their friends rise to attack them, which has a certain shock value if you think about it. Healing and necromancy therefore have quite a large impact on the battle. And speaking of mooks created by necromancy, your mook generator, so your mage who can summon golems, has a dramatic impact on the battle because he can send inanimate constructs to go serve as cannon fodder while, say, crack troops of highly skilled non-inanimate troops follow behind them. And that would be quite a strong tactic and would definitely change the flavor of the war. But the mook generator and the healer and the necromancy are still fairly direct applications of magic. You can go even subtler with your effects and have your magic impact your logistics. One of the adages of war is that an army marches on its stomach. What if that stomach was fed by magic? What if you didn't have to carry supplies with you? What if you didn't have to cook? What impact would that have on the speed and ability of your troops? Buffing your troops before battle, how would that impact their ability to keep going? In an even subtler application of magic, this is like... Subtlety of magic is like an onion, okay? It has layers. In an even subtler application, what about using illusions on the battlefield? We actually have used illusion in war before. It's just that it's more David Copperfield illusion rather than gnome illusionist illusion. 
During the Second World War, as part of Operation Overlord, the Allies launched Operation Bodyguard, the purpose of which was to mislead the German military command regarding where and when the Allies would launch their invasion of Normandy. It was an amazingly comprehensive operation, including fake planes at various staging areas that were meant to show that the Allies would invade Norway. They also fed false information through double agents and generally put up one hell of a show for the German leaders. Now imagine that, but with the power of real illusion behind it. That could dramatically alter the way that you approach warfare. And then what about majors as your snipers? What about majors as your crack SAS style of troops? What if you have majors who can teleport into a location, assassinate the enemy general and teleport out? The impact of that on your state of war would be dramatic because your general now has to be protected constantly against attack from any quarter. Or you have to figure out how to prevent such teleportation from happening. And that's, again, where your counterspelling and your magical protections come in. But these things have a duration, so you have to keep renewing the spell. So it becomes a very complicated art to keep your battle magic running in a smooth manner, especially in a case where you have ubiquitous magic. A great show of battle magic appears in The Witcher in episode 8. If you have not watched The Witcher from Netflix yet, you might want to skip to the chapter of including mages in your army, as this section will contain not plot spoilers, but magic spoilers. So skip on now if you want. Right. In The Witcher, the magic is fairly low-key until episode 8 of season 1, where we see magic explode in the battle. What I found really interesting about how they used magic here is that they started out with magic almost as support and logistics. There is a scene where the archers are firing arrows and those arrows are transported by the mage to hit key critical targets. Or the arrows explode to do almost artillery shelling damage. There's a great scene where they use alchemical powders to create a massive explosion. And another fantastic scene is where there is a mage holding a door by growing a plant into that door to block access. All this is still reasonably subtle application of magic. It's only right at the end where it seems that all is lost that one mage seriously unleashes. And she burns the whole battlefield down in a very direct display of a one-man army trope. That is to say the trope where one mage can kill a whole army. I'm quite interested in seeing how they handle this explosion of power in Season 2 of The Witcher. Comment down below, let me know where you have seen magic included in books, where it really altered the way that the war feels, where it changed battlefield tactics dramatically in a way that made you feel like you were experiencing a different world. So your models for inclusion are magic as part of the existing unit. This was done by Mercedes Lackey in Voldemort. The Empire did it this way, where mages were assigned to a squad and they worked with that squad. They were like another soldier, but assigned to the squad. This works best when your magic is reasonably common and reasonably interchangeable. So it's not a high specialization magic because soldiers are kind of uniform people. So if your majors are going to fit in with uniform people and be able to work in one squad or be assigned to another squad, then magic has to be kind of uniform. They have to have a certain level of skill and be able to do the same kind of thing. So they have to be able to buff, maybe a little bit of healing, maybe a little bit of like generating some heat or making food or whatever it is that they can do. There's got to be uniformity. You could also have magic as its own specialized unit. This works best when you have a situation where magic is rarer, so you need to consolidate your magic into a unit, or maybe where magic is very common, like in the bending world in The Last Avatar, where you've got squads of benders participating in the battle and doing the bulk of the fighting. 
You can also include magic in your armies through, through mages as the hero figure. So this works best where magic is either very rare or you have a one-man band effect. So what I mean by a one-man band is the mage can take on an army by themselves because they can lightning the crap out of it or fireball whole squadrons to death. You have to be a little careful with this model because if you don't have a reason why the mage can't act, then every battle is a foregone conclusion. The mage comes to the battlefield and all the fighting stops because they just take out everybody who opposes them. The end. And that's not a fun story to tell for anyone. And the last model for inclusion is magic as auxiliary troops. So this is typically where you have your magic as healers, your magic as buff bots, your magic as mook generators, and where they handle the logistics. Generally, this means that your magic is fairly rare and mages are too rare to risk close to the front. And those are your models for building magic into a fantasy army. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Just In Time Worlds. Please do hit the thumbs up button and let me know in the comments what you thought. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.